All right, let's now define edges more quantitatively. We agreed that an edge is a rate of change in intensity. And so it seems natural to go to the derivatives to quantify that rate of change. So let me remind you what we have here. We have a little magnified view of Einstein's tie. I'm showing you a 1D slice through this um, in terms of intensity, uh, white on top, black on the bottom, and we're going from left to right corresponding to um, that slice of the little image. And of course, that dot right there and that dot right there are the uh, points of maximal, in this case, uh, change in intensity. And so we can quantify that using the derivative. Now, this is the continuous time derivative. So notice I'm taking some function and I'm differentiating with respect to x, that's the horizontal line here, and that's equal to df dx, that's the standard differential operator, of course, and that, here's your standard derivative op, um, definition, it is the limit, as epsilon approaches zero, of f of x plus delta minus f, minus f of x over epsilon. So what am I asking? I'm asking, as I get infinitesimally closer and closer and closer, between f of x and f of x plus delta, what is the difference? The rate of change, the tangent, if you will. Perfectly fine definition if the signal is continuous. If the signal is um, both continuous and doesn't have a break in it. And so that is clearly not the case here. Why? Because this is a sampled image. Um, I've drawn this as if it looks like a continuous curve, but it's not. It just has a sample at, at pixel one, a sample at pixel two, and a sample at pixel three. And why is that a problem for my definition of a derivative? Well, because I'm trying to take a limit as epsilon approaches zero and taking the difference of these two values, and that doesn't make sense. At best, what I can do is look at neighboring pixels when epsilon is equal to, well, one is the best I can do. So here, is a discrete approximation to a derivative. It's gonna turn out it's not a very good uh, approximation, but it's gonna be good enough for what we have to do. So what have I done here? I've simply said, I'm gonna take the limit as epsilon approaches one, that's my sampling density on the pixels, and take the difference and then divide by one, and there, that's why, since I'm dividing by one, there's nothing in the denominator. So this is a discrete approximation, sometimes called finite differences, of the derivative of a discretely sampled signal. It'll tell me how much are things changing from pixel to pixel, which is exactly what I wanna know here. Where do I have the biggest change in intensity? All right, now the question is, well, how do I compute this? Well, there's a couple of questions. This is one dimensional. So what happens to the y direction? What if the rate of change is diagonal? So how do I deal with this two dimensional quantity is one question. And the second question is, how am I going to compute that? Well, this is actually pretty easy to compute. What do I do? Go to a pixel. Um, so I've, I've got this little grayscale image as input. Go to a pixel, look at the difference relative to your neighbor, and that difference is the output um, at the new pixel location. Move over one, take the difference, do it again. Move over one, take the difference, do it again, and keep going. Yep. What does that sound like, by the way? Do a computation, slide over. Do a computation, slide over. Do a computation, slide over. Sounds a lot like a convolution. And in fact, it is a convolution. In fact, that's actually what we saw when we introduced convolution, is we're going to take, except we're doing it in 1D now instead of 2D, we are going to take a two-dimensional image now and compute a, a discrete approximation to the directional derivatives. This is very important now. We've gone from 1D, where we introduced the concept, to 2D because we have an image. And what I want to know is what is the rate of change in the horizontal direction? And eventually I'm going to ask what is the rate of change in the vertical direction? And you got to be asking yourself, well, what about the obliques? What about 45 degrees? What about 60? It's going to turn out that those two directions are enough. Here it is. They form a basis. Um, and you'll see that in a little bit why that is. But for now, let's just, let's not worry about it. Let's just think about the X derivative. So the X derivative, there's my subscript right here, is, the, is a convolution of the full intensity image, f of x, y, with this little derivative filter or kernel, minus one, one. So if I take that little minus one, one, and I compute the differences going across like this, um, one scan line at a time, one scan line at a time, I'm going to have a high response where there's a big change in intensity and a low response where there's not. So imagine the, the white uniform patch there, if that little minus one is sitting there, um, then this pixel is 255, this pixel is 255, the rate of change is zero. Sure. Now imagine sitting right at this edge, 
ah, 255, something much lower than 255, big rate of change in intensity. All right, so that's the x derivative. What about the y derivative? Well, I just have to convolve in the other direction. So there I convolved with a row vector, that little minus 1, 1, and now I'm going to convolve with a column vector. And by the way, I could have done this with a 2D filter. It's just not necessary because I'm only interested in the rate of change in one direction. So I'm using the concept of separable filters, which we've already seen before, because I only care about the rate of change in these two directions, vertical and horizontal. So now your filter is simply minus 1, 1 in the vertical direction. And same thing, slide it along, slide it along, slide it along. You'll compute the differences um, in the vertical direction. Now, what comes out of this, I do two convolutions, and I get, because it's a two-dimensional signal, it's an image, and I get two derivatives, f of x, f of y. And so at each point, I have a vector-valued um, quantity. I know how much are things changing in the horizontal direction, and how much thing are things changing in the vertical direction. Now, what do I want to know? I just want to know how much are things changing. I mean, I may want to know the orientation. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But the biggest question when we were looking at that edge-detected image is how much change is here? And we can quantify that by thinking about that vector, f of x, f of y, um, is a point in this 2D vector space. And it has a couple of properties. It has an orientation. So is the rate of ch what, is, what is the direction of rate of change? So imagine that that vector was oriented exactly on the horizontal axis. What would that tell you? It would tell you there's a big rate of change in the x direction, but no rate of change in the y direction. Ah, it's exactly a vertical edge. What if that vector was rotated directly upwards? Big rate of change in the vertical direction, nothing in the horizontal direction. I must be looking at this kind of transition top to bottom. Oriented obliquely like this, which rates, it changes in both directions. So the angle here tells me what is the direction of maximal change. And of course, the magnitude of the vector, which is just the square root of the sum of the squares of the x and the y components, is how much is it changing. So if this vector gets bigger, well, then there's more change in y and x. And as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and closer and closer to origin, who cares what the orientation is at that point? There is no rate of change. So this two-dimensional quantity, which is the directional derivative in x and the directional derivative in y, can now be thought of not just in terms of the directions, but in terms of magnitude and orientation. What is the angle of maximal orientation, and what is the magnitude of that? And right now, we're only going to talk about magnitude, but down the line a little bit, we're going, to be, we're going to try to incorporate that orientation, because that is actually also important in terms of capturing some of the properties of the image. So what does that look like? Think about this really simple image. It's a white disk on a black background. And I computed the, the, the horizontal and the vertical derivative of that. That's f of x and f of y here, the horizontal and vertical derivative. And what do you see here? So here you see it's white um, on one side and black on the other side. Why, by the way, the change in colors? Because of the sign. So in one case, I'm going from black to white. And in the other case, I'm going from white to black. So one has a positive, one has a negative. So what you should know about these images, this image is, is, is scaled on 0 to 255. 0 is black, uh, white is 255. These two images are on a scale of something negative to something positive, and mid-level gray is 0, white is positive, black is negative. So I had to do this because my derivatives have negative values. Now, the magnitude doesn't have negative values. You'll see that in a minute. But the derivatives do. So we just have to change the mapping, the lookup table, between the values. So negative values go to 0. That was just a choice. Uh, 0 goes to gray. Positive values go to 1. And so here, what you see is uh, white and black on the edge of the uh, a disk and 0 everywhere else. Uh, the black background, no rate of change. The center of that disk, no rate of change, but around the boundary there is. And by the way, notice that at the top of the circle, there is no rate of change in the horizontal direction. That's correct, right? Because the tangent there looks like this. Now, over here, when I go to the vertical derivative, it's the opposite. I have a rate of change on the top and the bottom, but not on the edges. And you can see that these sort of complement each other. And now, if I compute the gradient, the 
square root of the sum of the squares of the two partial derivatives, what do I get? I get that guy right there, which is basically a uniform one all around because the gradient, the rate of change on that circle over there is exactly the same. The only thing that's changing is the orientation of that. And so when I compute the magnitude, I get that notion of where are the edges in the image, regardless of the orientation. And don't get me wrong, orientation matters. It's, it's actually a cue, it'll tell us something. But right now we're just interested in rate of change and later on we'll think about orientation and how that information may be useful. Derivatives have this really beautiful property and I'm only introducing this because I just think it's so incredibly beautiful. It's a beautiful linear algebraic property of derivatives, which is that once you know the derivative in the horizontal and vertical direction, you can tell what the derivative is in any orientation. These are so-called steerable derivatives. Actually, all derivatives are steerable, but this is called the steerable properties. It falls out of the linear algebraic property of derivatives, by the way, Hard to prove this in the space domain, but really easy to prove this in the Fourier domain, but I'm gonna forego the proof because it's a little tedious. So what I mean by steerability is that if I compute the horizontal derivative and I compute the vertical derivative, then I can tell you the derivative at any orientation theta by taking a linear combination of those two derivatives. There it is, it's a basis. These two derivatives form a, a basis for all possible direction, directional derivatives, and the equation goes like this. The derivative at any orientation theta is cos theta times f of x plus sine theta times f of y. Let's do a little sanity check here. If theta is zero, what happens? Well, cos of zero is one, so we get f of x, and sine of zero is zero, so we get f of x. Good, that's the horizontal derivative at zero. Let's go to 90 degrees. Uh, cos of, of, of 90 is zero, sine of 90 is one. I get the y derivative. And in between, I take a linear combination of those two weighted by cos theta and sine theta. That sounds a lot like a linear basis. And then I can determine what is the, or, the derivative at any orientation. I don't have to compute derivatives at different orientations. It's the really lovely property of derivatives called steerability. Steerability has been used for many, many years in image processing and computer vision. There are steerable pyramids and there's a whole literature around these types of, of filters and I thought it was worth uh, mentioning. So now let's apply this to a regular image. So we've got our favorite um, Einstein image. Here is the horizontal derivative. You can see rates of change uh, from left to right. Here is the vertical derivative, rates of change um, top to bottom. And of course, here is the gradient. And by the way, we saw this before. I just showed you those convolution kernels, those filters, but I didn't tell you where they came from. And now we know. We're, we have a discrete approximation to a derivative, one minus one. Um, by the way, that's not a great derivative. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit because it's gonna matter later on when, when you really need to compute derivatives and not just create pictures um, like this to, to figure out where the transition and the edges are. All right, let's look at the code now to implement all of this. So I'm gonna ask you to write some code to compute the directional derivatives by steering the horizontal and vertical derivatives. And here's the equation again. The derivative at any orientation theta is cos theta times f of x plus sine theta times f of y. And I'm gonna give you the derivatives to, to start out with and you're gonna do the steering of those and visualize the derivative. Okay, here are the two derivative filters, by the way, there's two filters here, and I didn't have two filters before. I just had the one, minus one, uh, one. Turns out that's not a very accurate uh, derivative. And I just want you to do the accurate derivative, and then later on I'm gonna tell you why we are choosing these. But for now, I'm gonna define two filters. One filter is called P, pre-filter, and one is called D, derivative filter. And let's just look at the values here a little bit. So what you notice here is these are all positive values. They're small, they get bigger, they get bigger, and then they get small. So this is a symmetric filter. It sums to one, by the way. And it, if you plotted it, it would look something like this, like a little Gaussian. We know what that is, it's a low pass filter. It's gonna do a little bit of blurring, a little bit of averaging. This guy right here looks a lot like a derivative filter. There's two negative values over here. There's a zero here, and there's a couple of positive values here, and it's anti-symmetric. Right, so I've got positive 0.1, negative 0.1, positive 0.29, negative 0.29, and, and zero in the middle. So it sort of looks like a derivative, but there's five values, five taps, as we call them, uh, in the filter. Why? 
suspend disbelief for a minute. I'll explain that later on um, in a couple of lectures. But for now, here's how we're going to compute the derivatives. We're going to compute the x derivative by, well, obviously differentiating in the x direction, but we're also going to convolve by this p filter in the y direction. Again, that's for a very good mathematical reason, which I'm going to forgo explanation of right now. The y derivative is uh, apply that pre-filter, that slight blurring or averaging filter in the x direction and differentiate in the y direction. Okay? So out of these two, once you've loaded the image of course, so you can load the Einstein image, you will get two images. The image x, the image y, which you saw on the previous slide, which correspond to the x derivative and the y derivative. And what, what I want you to do is for every theta, let's do it in increments of one degree or five degrees, whatever you want, compute for me, please, the directional derivative by taking this linear combination and visualize it. Of course, you have to visualize, otherwise you don't know if you got it right. All right, please take a few minutes um, to write this code and I'll show you my solution in a second. All right, let's look at the solution. I'm gonna import a bunch of stuff. There's some fussy stuff here, the IPython display and the time, which was just for the visualization, because I'm gonna try to display this um, as a movie. You could have just displayed it in a subplot or displayed one image at a time, but this, I just wanted to create a nice animation here. So here's what I had before. I'm gonna do this for a disk image. You could have done it for the Einstein image. Here are my two filters. Here's the two derivatives that I defined up top. And now I have a for loop here that is going from zero to 360 and steps of five degrees I chose. And what I'm going to do is create the figure and here's the steerability. I'm going to show um, uh, the theta, which by the way is in degrees, you have to be really careful here. Um, so I convert it to radians, I compute the cosine and I multiply it by the x derivative. Here's the theta, convert to radians, um, take the sine, multiply it by the y derivative, and then display that with a gray color map. This color map, by the way, is just another word for a lookup table. When you display images by default, sometimes it wants to map gray values into color, and so you specify a gray to make sure that zero goes to black and uh, 255 goes to white. Um, I've got a title to tell me what the orientation is, and then I've got just a little bit of code here to uh, sleep so I can watch the, the, uh, the image, and then uh, I clear the display and it goes over and over again. So this part down here at the very bottom is just a nicety for the animation. So if you plot this code, what you will see is that white black ring steer around the disk from here to top and around. And if you do it for Einstein, it looks even cooler because you'll see the different parts of the image being emphasized depending on where there is a maximal change in orientation. Now, this is the most basic type of edge detection. Um, there are, are decades long pieces of literature on how to do edge detection and how to get the, the best refined um, results and how to be robust and how to be computationally efficient. We're not gonna really dig so much into that because it, it creates just a lot of sort of noise in my opinion about what's really going on here. But the core concept is that we are going to approximate the differential operator to compute derivatives directional derivatives, in fact, x derivative, y derivatives. We can think about the magnitude, how much change is happening. We'll eventually think about orientation, like where is the change? Is it something vertically oriented? Is it something oblique? Is it something horizontal? Um, and that turns out to be a very strong signal for object recognition. Now, there's one thing that we haven't done here. We've, we've always assumed that it's an edge. It's a change from dark to bright or bright to dark. That's not the only type of transition in an image. Try to think about what another type of transition is, and when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about that.